kind of this, you'll see there, I think, two periods on the chart where the fastest rates of growth occur. And those are periods where you have fast appreciation in, in market conditions and relatively low levels of inflation, which is the number that we would invest in. So that's true in the sort of late 1990s, early 2000s, before we see the housing market collapse. And then again in the late 2010s, before we start to see COVID era inflation. Um, you'll note too that over the four year period preceding 2023, and we know there's going to be a large increase in this part, um, inflation adjusted property taxes really didn't grow very much post COVID, despite the fact that nominal property tax collections grew a lot. And that's because we're comparing this to a, a quite high rate of inflation. Now, that tells you the story of how much we're actually collecting in taxes. One of the things that the chair asked me to look into was how this compares to the rate of growth in the overall economy. Essentially, is government becoming a larger section of our economy over time? And so this chart attempts to answer that question. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the methodology here, only a little bit because I don't want all of your eyes to completely glaze over. Um, what I've done here is I've compared the exact same data set that I just showed you, inflation adjusted property taxes, to gross state product, which is, if you know gross domestic product as a measure of the US economy, gross state product is a measure of the total output of goods and services in the Colorado River. Um, and so what you'll see here is initially in the 90s, a pretty serious decline in the initial level of property taxes compared to the economy. This is a time of fast economic growth in the United States and in Colorado in a period of relatively slower growth in property taxes. Um, that ceases to be the case after about 2000. And I think there are a couple reasons for that. First, we know that many local governments lifted TABOR constraints that initially applied after 1992, um, and that voters in many cases relaxed or did away with entirely um, over the period of the late 1990s. Um, after that point, we also see those additional special districts additions um, and new revenue being collected from newly authorized mills. Um, we also see an increase in the number of mobility overrides that are approved at the school district level. And then probably more intricacies beyond that that I'm not able to comment on just because this is such a diverse space. Um, what, what you'll see here is that property taxes made up 2.8% of Colorado's gross state product in 1992 and 2.6% in 2022. So over the entire 30 year period of this chart, there was a slight decline in the proportion of the economy that was, um, that was made up in property tax collections. Um, but I note that the trough on the chart was 2.0% of gross state product in the year 2000, and we have seen in general an increase since that time. As a point of comparison, I wanted to present the story for the state government, which of course does not collect property taxes, um, but has a nexus with the property tax puzzle through mostly the school finance presentation that you just heard. Um, here, the, the question of how to measure state revenue is an interesting one. I've shown three different methods of doing that on this chart. Um, one is state revenue subject to TABOR, which is of course what TABOR is trying to constrain. Um, one is state general fund revenue, and you'll see in recent years that actually surpasses revenue subject to TABOR because the general fund now receives marijuana tax collections and Proposition DE tobacco and nicotine tax collections that are, that are general fund revenues that are not subject to TABOR. Um, and then you'll see a line that I've labeled all state revenue, and that dwarfs the other two. Um, there are many sources of revenue that are included in the state's accounting documents that may not feel like state revenue um, to a, an observer. And so I kind of wanted to explain what all is in there. For example, um, a college student attending a state university and may pay tuition to go to that state university. That is considered state revenue for the purposes of this chart. A college graduate donating money to their university is also considered state revenue for the purposes of the black line in this chart. Um, a, a state pension recipient making contributions to the, the state pension fund may be accounted as state revenue for the purposes of this chart. Certainly, if I'm you know, putting money in my daughter's college savings account, my deposits into that 529 account, because they are managed in state enterprise, are considered state revenue for the purposes of this chart. So when you see that state revenue totals 
you know, close to $60 billion, that's reflective of a, a number of sources over which the government doesn't have discretion to spend. I wanted to make sure that was crystal clear in, in presenting it to this group. Um, so actual collections um, were $54 billion in FY21-22. Um, again, adjusting for inflation to 2023, I'm putting that as $59 million in the chart. Um, in FY93-94, which is the first year for which we have um, that all state revenue figure, it was $9 billion nominal dollars adjusted here as $20.7 million at the time of inflation. So total growth in revenue exceeded inflation by 3.8% for that black line. Over the period, again, we said property taxes was 3.8%. Um, all state revenue was 3.8% over a similar time period. Um, for the general fund, it was lower, 2.7%. And for just that Tabor line, the gold line, it's 1.1%. And that makes sense, right? Because Tabor only allows growth at the level of inflation plus population growth. We're already heading out inflation. And so we're just talking about the, the cumulative effect of growth in state population over this time period. Um, the fastest period of growth by far was in the COVID era, but we know that that's because of federal support for the state economy. <laughs> um, the period of growth before that, though, from FY93-94 to FY18-19 was 3.5% average annual growth. So 3.5 is less than 3.8. Um, but it's not radically different. The, the COVID bump is not really change the overall story. Again, comparing that to gross state product, um, what you'll see is that this was, for the black line, the all state revenue line, this was 9.1% of the state economy. And FY93-94 increased at 11.5%. And FY21-22, um, it grew faster from the trough level. So again, Tabor was more effective at constraining the growth of government in the 90s, um, where we got down to that trough of 7.6% of gross state product in um, FY98-99. Tabor revenue, um, as a proportion of the state economy, declined from 5.6% in FY92-93 to 3.4% in FY21-22. And general fund revenue declines from 3.8% in FY92-93 to 3.7% in FY21-22. Um, what, what I thought was particularly interesting in this chart is the general fund line, and in particular that the trough level was in FY09-10, which I think anyone who was around the state government at that time would tell you that that was by far the most difficult year for the state budget at the very lowest level of the Great Recession. What I think is interesting in the context of this discussion is if we're talking about how government revenues or government size has performed relative to the economy, we're already controlling for the size of economic output on this chart. So even with a small economy, state revenue became a smaller portion of that small economy during a recessionary episode. That's something I have to think about a lot in my job, which is that it's not just the case that revenue moves with economic conditions. Revenue that the state collects in terms of income and sales taxes moves more, um, more strongly in the aggressive of the economy, more strongly aggressively in the direction of the economy than the economy itself does. So we experience lower lows in state revenue during recessionary episodes and higher highs um, than the economy at large in economic expansion. And I think this chart does a good job of both. So it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, to help you derive some conclusions from the presentation, I'd say that if you look at just a nominal rate of growth in state revenue or local revenue from property taxes, you're going to see a rocket shift, right? Because you're not controlling fairly for things that contribute to that. Once you adjust for inflation, you still see pretty significant growth in both state and local revenues, including property tax revenues. Once you control for the size of the overall economy, the picture becomes a little bit muddier in terms of, of what happens. I'd say in general, a little bit of a decline in the 90s and a little bit of growth in the two years more re or the two decades um, since then, um, but a little bit of a mixed bag as well, depending on exactly what period of time you're analyzing. Mr. Chair, that concludes my prepared presentation. Happy to take any questions before you take your break.
All right, got just a couple minutes here. Uh, Commissioner Pelton. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Zelke. I'm curious, have you done any comparison to other states? When you talk about more is generated through our GDP, we get 26%. So what does that look like when you compare it to states like Texas, Florida, some of our competing states? Uh, I'm not sure fully how your state, but that's a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sebesky. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Herman, for the question. So we used to do this all the time. And we actually stopped, and I'll, I'll explain why. The data that I use to prepare this presentation are data that I have a lot of confidence in. Like, I have a good history of first state products. There's actually a data break from 1997 where we started calculating it differently at the federal level, but setting that aside, I'm very confident in the revenue data, right? Like, what I get from DPP on the volume of property taxes is really solid and reports the same way year to year. And what I have in terms of the state's financial figures is also like all consistent and substantial. There are the national, um, the US Bureau of Census does put together a data set that tells you about the level of revenue collected by all states in the country. And we have used that in the past to prepare a sort of state by state comparison of how do state revenues compare to state GSP for every state across the US. The reason we stopped doing that is because the Census Bureau's data for Colorado state revenue don't match any of the state revenue data that we have. And so we're not confident that those data credibly represent our state revenue. I don't know exactly how the Census Bureau goes about producing that data set, but because we couldn't rectify it, or um, that's not the right use of that word, because we couldn't match it to our data set, we weren't comfortable continuing to publish that document. I will tell you what we found when we did publish it, though, because I think that's still helpful. Um, what we have found the, in, as of the most recent publication is that Colorado has among the smallest state level governments in terms of state level government size in the country. Um, however, Colorado's local government sizes were comparatively large by national standards. I, the, the rankings that I remember in my head, I'm going to say them because I think that they're helpful in answering your question, but I'm not even 100% sure these are the right numbers. I think what we have most recently was Colorado had the 46th largest state government as compared to the size of the state economy, and about the 17th largest local government as an aggregate compared to the size of the state economy. Um, there's been a lot of conversation over the past year about the relative size of Colorado's property taxes. And it's true that we collect relatively low rates of property taxes compared to the strength of our market. There's a couple things that that matters. One is that market conditions in Colorado are stronger than most places in the country. And so having a low rate of taxation is counterbalanced to some extent by the fact that property values are high here. And the other is that local governments are also having to sales taxes. And local government rates of sales taxation are higher in Colorado than in most other states. By contrast, our level of state sales taxes, I think the lowest in the country among states that levy sales taxes. So again, I'm just Final questions. All right, we want to say a huge thank you. Uh, I really appreciate your.